The meaning of a logic program actually boils down to that of a set of rules. Now the idea of the Redux based semantics is to go even one step further and to say, okay, let's first handle a simple case, the case of positive uh, rules, and then once one has a solution for this simpler case, generalize to arbitrary rules. So the question we are actually looking at at the beginning now is, what is the meaning of a set of positive rules? Now, this is actually well understood in the literature and the idea is to say, okay, the meaning of a set of positive rules is the set of atoms that are derivable from the rules in the program. Okay, but what are the atoms derivable from the rules? So, this is something we have to make precise. For this, let's just give these guys names. We call our program, our positive program P, and all the atoms that are derivable from it are in a set X. And now the question is, how can we characterize this set of derivable atoms given a positive logic program P? Now, a first way to do this is to look at a procedural characterization. The idea is now to loop over the applicable rules. So initially, all hats of facts are derivable. Then in the next step, all heads of rules whose body is contained in the facts is derivable. And this continues until no more atoms are derivable. Okay, let's make this precise with this little procedure here. So we have here our set X. Initially we set it to zero. And then the idea here is to say, okay, as long as we produce new atoms, we add all the new atoms to the previous contents of X until, again, no more uh, atoms are derivable. Okay, but what does it mean an atom is derivable? You see this actually here in this, in this set. So the idea is you look at all the rules in the, keep in mind, the positive program. And the, if the body of the, if the body, and this, here the positive body is enough, of, of a rule is completely contained in X, then the rule, so to speak, fires and the, its head is derived and all the heads obtained in that way are or constitute the next value uh, of, of x. One thing to tell you right away, this operation is always monotonic in the sense that the, the, the result of the operation is a superset of the input of the x. Okay, this is also what, what we exploit here a little bit, so we check. So this is the set of all derivable atoms from x, and the condition says, well, we enter the loop as long as we somehow can derive more hats or if the output of this operation is larger than what we had before. That's actually why, since it's monotonic, I can simply get away with, a, with, an, with an unequal here. Okay, but nonetheless, I think as a computer scientist, if you look at this, it's ugly code, right? Because we have the same operation uh, twice. And actually, this, is, this type of operation is well known in the literature. It's called the TP operator. And I just introduced this now as a procedure. But attention, I'm pretty lazy, so I actually omit the opening parentheses and the closing parentheses because we'll see later on that I will be nesting these guys and then this will be full of parentheses. That's why I, I omit these guys. Hope you don't mind. Anyway, now we more or less have defined this TP operator, like an auxiliary procedure, and this actually uh, uh, simplifies our iteration much more. So let's actually look at it again. So we set X uh, at the beginning to the empty set. So if we cannot produce actually more conclusions than we had before, we skip and we return X. Otherwise, if we can still produce more conclusions than we had before, we, we take this set of new conclusions and make this the new value of X. Okay, let's look at, let's look at this briefly. So here's a very simple example. A is true, A is a fact. And if we have A, we, have also, we should also get B. Now, I think intuitively, it's clear what we want from this example, again, with the idea that we really only accept things that, that really have a derivation, that have a proof, right? Here, A and B is the desired result. This is the set of atoms that should be derivable from the, from the program. Now, let's check this with the procedure. So initially, we set X to the empty set. And I'm indicating this here with a subscript zero. 
Now, which rules are applicable with respect to the empty set? Well, only the facts. That is, only rules that have an empty body, because they satisfy this condition here. These are all the, the empty sets are all the subsets of the empty set. Well, a truism, but well, it helps us to kick the whole procedure off. So what the only head we can derive at the beginning are the heads of the heads of the facts. In our case, this is A. So we derive A with the TP operator from the empty set. Now, this condition here is satisfied because we get more conclusions than we had before. We enter the loop and the result of the TP operator is the initial value of the next iteration. Now, we check which rules are applicable with, with respect to A. Again, all the rules that have been applicable with respect to the empty set are also applicable with respect to a larger set because we only deal with positive programs. Okay, now what is applicable with respect to this set? Of course, the fact is applicable, so we can reproduce A here. But now also the body of the second rule is contained in, in the set and we can also produce B. So we now have A and B. Now, still, the condition of our while loop is satisfied because we were able to derive more than we had before. So we enter the body of the loop and we set the previous result as the initial value here, check which rules are applicable, and as you can presumably guess, we produce A, of course, again. And since the same A is also a subset of the input, we can also produce the B. So now we actually reproduce the, the input. Now this condition here is not satisfied anymore. We exit the loop and return A and B as uh, the result of our procedure. So this more, I think this more or less reproduces the intuitions many of us had that if you have a program where A is a fact and you have a rule B of A that you should produce A and B. And this nicely shows how things are derived from the facts by forward chaining, by applying rules, applying rules until no more conclusions are forthcoming. Okay, let's look at a slightly different example or augmented example. So let's add the rule D if C. Now, first let's look at this intuitively. So what are the atoms we should be deriving from this program? Again, A is a fact, it should be derivable. And since we have derived A, we should also derive B. Now here we have the rule D if C. Well, if we take the implication serious and this notion of, of, of proving things from the facts along in a forward chaining way along the arrow, well, there's no way to derive C. Well, there's not even a rule that has C in the head. We have A in the head, B in the head, D in the head. So which rule should give us C? So in a way, we should not we cannot derive C, hence we can also not derive D. That at least would be my intuition. Let's at least, let's look what the procedure has to say on that. As before, we start with the empty set, we add the, the fact A to, to the whole thing, then we have derived A, and now since we have A, we can still of course derive A, but now we can also fire this rule here and derive B, so we get A and B. Now we start from A and B, and again, First rule is applicable, it's a fact. Second rule is applicable because we have A, but here D and C, well, we can't, we don't have C, we can't apply the rule. Hence, we get here a, a fixed point. So more or less, this condition here is not satisfied. We exit and we return X. So the conclusion of this is A and B. And again, I would argue that this procedure at least produces the, the, the results one should expect because there's no, there's no way to derive C or D or whatever, and hence they should not be uh, among the, the conclusions and thus not be, not be part of the meaning of the program. So, as a result, one could say the procedural answer to our question, how to characterize the atoms derivable from a program, is given by the return value of the procedure. So, if you, if you have the program, you apply the procedure, you start with the, with the empty set, at the facts, then apply those rules that are applicable with respect to the last, last iteration until no more atoms can be derived. These are the atoms derivable from a positive program. Okay, so this is a procedural answer. Let's actually see whether we can, because after all, this is a bit hacky, right, to argue in terms of procedures. 
even though I think rule application has this flavor and I think it ni is nicely captured, let's see whether we can capture this, the result actually of this procedure also in a mathematical way. Now the idea of a mathematical characterization is to identify the properties that the set of derivable atoms should satisfy. So rather than constructing it in a procedural way as before, the idea is to say, okay, you give me or I give you a, a candidate, you check the properties, and if the properties are satisfied, then my candidate uh, contains all atoms that are derivable from the, from the program. In fact, if we look at the interior of the TP operator, this already smells like the mathematical concept of the closure. And we can actually use this to mimic or to distill more or less a property for that. So here, here it is. So we can say that the set of atoms is closed under the positive rules in a, in a program if the head of a rule is contained in the set whenever the rule is applicable, then whenever all positive body literals are contained in X. So this is more or less the, the core of the TP operator. So let's look at, at how this definition works. Here's again our example. So we have A and we have B if A. And now the idea is again not to construct it but to say here's a candidate set, let's verify the condition. Okay, first candidate is the empty set closed under P. Well, Actually, the positive body of our fact is contained in the empty set. Hence, A should be inside as well. Hence, this is not closed. Okay. Now, is A closed under P? Well, the for the first rule, it's okay. So, the, the, the body of this rule is contained in, in, A, in, in the set containing A. And A is inside. That's good. But now, the second rule says, well, actually, its body is contained in in the set, well, since A is, of course, here, here, here in A, but B is not inside, so this set isn't closed either. Next candidate is the set that contains B only. Well, again, um, this does not satisfy the first rule. Actually, it satisfies the second rule, right? Because A is not contained in the set uh, where B, where only B is, is, is contained, hence, this, the condition is satisfied for this rule, no matter whether B is inside or not. Since A is not inside, the condition is satisfied. Okay, so this set is also not closed under P. Now, here's our favorite candidate, A and B. So, is A and B closed under P? Well, first rule, of course, this rule is applicable, the body is contained in here, so the fact must also be inside, right? That's obvious, more or less. The body of the second rule, A, is also contained. Here is our A. So B must be inside. B is inside. Great. This set is closed under P. So A and B is a closed set under this logic program here, as was expected. Again, this works nicely in this case. Now let's again look at our augmented example. Now recall from before that the intuition on this example was that the set of derivable atoms consists of A and B, because we have A as a fact, and since we have A, we also have B, but there's no way to derive C, and hence also no way to derive D. The other thing perhaps to note is that when we dealt only with the first two rules, we had four possibilities. The empty set, the set where only A is contained, the set where only B is contained in, and then the set where <laughs> A and B are both contained in. Let's do it like this. Anyway, but now actually we have four, uh, four uh, atoms, hence we have 16 possibilities and I will not go through all the 16 sets now. Let's just look at some of them and in particular to some that we have seen before. Anyway, first question is, is the empty set closed under P? Well, of course it is not closed because the fact more or less, the fact is applicable since the body is contained in it but A is not contained in it. So this is not closed under, under P. Uh, the, even though more or less the set that contains A is closed under the first rule, it is not closed under the second rule because the rule is applicable since A is contained in it, but B is not contained. So this violates the, con this violates the condition, hence this set is also not closed. Now, is B closed un under P? Well, again, it's not closed because it violates the first rule because the fact should be contained in it. 
And here is finally our most preferred set, A and B. And again, it contains A and B because the first and the second rule uh, satisfy the condition. The, the precondition is satisfied, hence the, the head must be uh, in, in the set. Now, the, for the third rule, actually it does not even generate a condition because the precondition here is false, so the body of the rule, that is C, is not contained. And so we also only have to check whether the head is inside whenever this condition is satisfied. So this is a bit of a sub sub subtlety about this de the definition, right? So only if the body is contained, so only if C is contained in the set, we have to make sure that the head is contained as well. Otherwise, there's no condition that emerges, right? No condition that has to be verified. Hence, in this case, uh, since C is not inside, there's no condition imposed on D, and uh, it, this, this set here is closed because it satisfies, actually it satisfies this condition for all three rules. Just in the first two cases, this condition, the condition on the body is satisfied, and we also have to check the condition on the head. So A is inside, B is inside. For the third rule, this condition is not satisfied, hence we don't have to check anything else. So this, con this set is closed under P. Okay, now let's look actually if we add C to the whole thing. Now, we, the, the, the body of the rule, so the, this condition here is satisfied because C is contained in the set. And now the head has to be in it as well. So D had to be inside, but it is, this is not the case. Hence, this set is not closed under P because it violates the condition for the last rule. Now, if we only put D inside without C, Again, as before, right? So, since C is not contained in the set, we don't have to check whether the head is inside or not. We don't, we, we don't care whether D is inside or not. Because since C is not inside, we don't have to check the head. So, the rule is inapplicable. We don't have to check it. But interestingly, we can, a set that contains the conclusion is nonetheless closed. So, closure more or less is perhaps not the... Uh, not the sharpest condition because this is somehow, this set is somehow something that ha has bears some redundancy because it contains D even though there is no proof for D. Okay, so this set is closed even though actually our procedure had not produced that. Now, if we have both C and D, then uh, the, again the head of the of the third rule is contained in it, and so we say that then the head no the body of the third rule is contained. So this is our C here. Hence, the head must be contained as well. This is our D, this is the case. And hence, this uh, set here is also closed under the third rule, as well as the first and the second, because we have A and B. And so this set is also closed under, under P. But again, the, it's a bit questionable, because who gives us the proof for C, right? But if you throw it up, if you throw it in, just like... Um, in the Münchhausen stories, which is this German anecdote where the guy can pull himself out of the swamp just by pulling his hair, this is a little bit what's happening. You throw, you throw C in and D in, and then, well, things are, things are closed, even though there was no original derivation for C. In the same way, if you throw in even more garbage, right, E, which is, does not even occur here, uh, this is also closed because it doesn't violate the condition on the rules. And you see a bit the, 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 the mismatch with this condition is the condition is is on the is in well the conditions on closure are induced by the rules right but if things are going on outside of the rules like e here or you just throw in c and d then the, these constraints may be satisfied even though there is no derivation so then the, the the way out of this actually is that to say okay the meaning of p is not given by all closed uh, sets, but only by the smallest ones, and the smallest ones under set inclusion. And actually, what was the smallest one that we have seen? A and B. So let's just go back, right? So this set here was closed, A, B, C, D, and A, B, C, and D, and E. A, B, C, D was closed, but actually the smallest one uh, is actually A and B. And this is the intended semantics of our program. So, Again, the, the notion of closure, closure is not bad. Uh, it more or less identifies different sets that are candidates, but the unique set of derivable atoms is given by the smallest set of atoms that are closed under P. Now you may ask, you know, when I write the smallest set, it actually means that there is a unique one, and actually this is, 
this is uh, the case. Because there is a property in the background that we don't have to elaborate here in the course, perhaps in the exercises, that if you take a set closed under P and another set closed under P and you intersect them, the result is also closed under P. And hence the intersection of all closed sets gives you a unique set and this is the smallest set. And since this set has such a prominent role, there's actually a notation for this. We call, we use this um, operator or function cn. So if we have a program P, a positive, keep in mind we are still with positive programs, but if you have a positive program P, then this subset smallest model of atoms closed under P is denoted by cn of P, and these are called the consequences of P. Okay, anyway, so the mathematical answer to our question, how to characterize the set of atoms derivable from a positive program is, it's the smallest set of atoms closed under P. That's pretty elegant, right? So again, different from, from the procedural way, now you take an X and you can just check whether this is the smallest set of atoms closed under P, and if it is, then this is the semantics. Okay, so let's sum up. So after all, we have elaborated upon two different answers to our question, what is the meaning of a set of positive rules? We have received a procedural and a mathematical answer. The first one was the value returned by the procedure that we've given before applied to our positive program, where we start from the empty set and derive things until nothing else can be derived, and then bang, this is the set. And the math math mathematical answer is the set of consequences of a positive program, and this set is the set inclusion minimal set closed under the positive program. Hmm, I also had to think now. Anyway, the good news is that both of them coincide. So the set X that is actually returned by our procedure is exactly the set of consequences of our positive program. That's actually pretty, pretty, pretty good news. So we have a, a procedural way to characterize the set of atoms derivable from a positive program and a mathematical one. In fact, uh, there's even a logical one, because I promised you that we can actually access the semantics of, of answers and programming just by looking at sets, and that's true. But let's actually nonetheless look at this relation briefly. So the logical answer, and more is relating this to logic, is that is the set of atoms closed under a positive program correspond to the models of the program and well and vice versa so to speak so so more or less what we have already done by by looking at the closure gives us exactly the models they filter out the models among all possible interpretations and now the set of consequences which was before the smallest set or which is the smallest uh, set closed under the positive program corresponds to the smallest model of p and again keep in mind Interpretations and models we represent by, by sets, and then we can use set operations and also talk about the smallest model, right? It's we take all the models, intersect them, and the smaller mo smallest model that we get corresponds to the consequences of the problem. So this gives us even a third characterization. So for those of you who want to learn more a little bit about the logical uh, relationship, stay tuned for the next uh, episode, and otherwise, well, just jump on to the, to the one above to, to finally see what is a stable model. See you then. So for those of you interested, here are some logical remarks on what we have been doing so far. In fact, positive rules are referred to in classical logic as definite clauses. So a positive rule of the form A0 if A1 and A2 and, and, and AM corresponds to a disjunction that you see right there, which has exactly one positive atom, and this is the head of a positive rule. And here it is well known that a set of definite clauses has a unique smallest model. So these manipulations do not necessarily carry over to the logic underlying ASP, but in the case of positive programs, we have this nice relationship. So definite clauses are these type of clauses. Horn clauses are a slight generalization while here we, in definite clauses, we have exactly one positive atom. In horn clauses, we have at most one positive atom. And so definite clauses are a subclass, a subclass of horn clauses. And in fact, the ones 
the, the, the horn clauses that are non-definite, that is the ones that have only negative atoms, corresponds to what we will later on see are integrity constraints. And way later on, no goods. But again, this is a bit hand-waving and I refer all to, to what we will be doing in the future. And the set of horn clauses has a smallest model or none. Because here actually you can destroy all the possible models. And again, in, in classical logic, the smallest model is the intended uh, semantics of such a set of clauses, definite or horn clauses. And given this model is what we have seen on the other slide, given a positive program, the consequences of the of the program correspond to the smallest model of the set of definite clauses that correspond to P. So if you take the positive program, translate it into these definite clauses, look at the smallest model, this is more or less the semantics. And that's actually how you can compute this in, in, in classical logic. So this was the excursion, and next we will finally look at what is a stable model. Stay tuned.